good evening everybody and welcome to Let's Talk Assassin's Creed, your number one podcast for all things Assassin's Creed. Good evening everybody and welcome to episode 117 of Let's Talk Assassin's Creed. Um, this episode kind of uh, came about naturally when we were speaking a few weeks ago, when we did our um, Odyssey and Valhalla crossover reaction episode, which we, we planned at very short notice and uh, we invited a surprise extra guest. Uh, Louise, say hello. Hello. Are you ready to and, pitch the pot, folks? Oh, absolutely. But do you remember, <laughs> we, 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 we went a bit off topic when we were chatting about Odyssey and Valhalla, <laughs> and we mentioned that we should talk about Lydia Fry. So here we are to talk about Lydia Fry. Yeah. Um, but we must start with confession time. Um, who here has not played the Lydia Fry story? Me. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's been Shame. fun, guys. Yep. Unfollow, blocked, yep. reported. Unsubscribe. Bye. <laughs> Done. Thanks, Declan, mate. See you. It's, <laughs> it's it's on my playlist, but because I had because I saw my PlayStation Four, I didn't get round to doing it. Even though it is something I really wanted to do, because I enjoyed all the Helix missions in Unity, especially the one where we could climb the Eiffel Tower. I thought that was spot oh, on. Vichy Be- mm. France. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I wanted to do that again in Syndicate. It, it sounded exciting and I was going to do it, but life happened. So I may never do it, but I've watched YouTube on it. So that's all that matters. There's some very good like YouTube resources. Like some YouTubers who actually upload like full, like quote unquote cinematics movies yeah. of the games. Because that is how I got into some of the uh, earlier games when I started off at Unity. Like, the guy who got me into AC was a massive Black Flag fan, but I didn't have the game, so I just watched it as like a like a movie, essentially, on YouTube before I bought it. Yeah, yeah. The one, I actually, I asked this very question today in, in uh, the Sisterhood Discord, because I, I know that there's channels out there and I've never watched one, and uh, I was recommended a channel called Gamers Little Playground. Yeah, make, that's the exactly, one that I got introduced to. That's the one, to. right, yeah. okay, yeah. So that is a handy resource to have if you want to, just watch the story. I mean, I, I had a quick look through their Assassin's Creed um, playlist and it's all very well organized. They've got like separate playlists for the DLCs. And then I thought just for fun, I'll have a look at Valhalla, just the cutscene. So the, the, the cinematic movie of Valhalla is about 22 hours of YouTube content. So anyway, that's longer than bloody AC1 and AC2 probably put together. But anyway, um, <laughs> we, we're we already off topic Tangent. and we're already two minutes, three minutes in. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> I tell you what, I will admit, so I played Syndicate, Syndicate was my first quote unquote proper Assassin's Creed game uh, back in 2020. And I also did not play the World War One sequence. I also did not play the Jack the Ripper um, DLC. I just played the main story. I didn't really get these things like helix glitches and rifts because mm. I didn't really understand. Coming from Odyssey and Origins, you're not really taught what the animus is and that there's these sort of hidden messages and hidden memories if you like in the in the animus or, or whatever so i saw this weird icon on the thames and thought now nah, i don't know what that is I'm, i've done the story i'll move on and i went and played ac2 i'm very glad i've gone back to syndicate in the last three months or two months As and i've I. played <laughs> yeah <laughs> and played played this content um so two of us can 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 talk about lydia fry and declan you've been doing your research i'm sure I always do honourable research through <laughs> YouTube and Wikia because I will get, I will play it one day, but for now it's YouTube and Wiki all the way. <laughs> good man, good man. That's enough. That's enough. <laughs> so where do we start? Uh, should we start with Lydia Fry's family? Yeah, I suppose that's easier. Yeah, it's... go on then, Louise. Talk us through it. So her parents, we do not know. But one of them is clearly, clearly Jacob's son, people are assuming. Because it's a bit confusing. Because in the. So we have Jacob is not married in canon, or we don't know who his partner is. Mm. We don't know who he got married or had a child with. But he clearly had a child because Lydia is a thing. Um, all we know about her parents is that when she was younger, they're both assassins and they go off in Europe and most likely around the world to go and help the other brotherhoods to the point that she was trained by grandpa Jacob and great aunt Evie. 
Oh, that's just adorable already. I just, I just love the idea of Evie trying to teach her four languages at once to this toddler. <laughs> it's like, Evie, Evie, Evie. You just switch from Punjabi, Latin, French, and Welsh in one sentence. Give the girl a rest, okay? <laughs> but yeah, we, we don't even know what her dad's called. Like, um, we don't know what her mum's called. Um, we have a year of birth from the database in Syndicate, I think. Yeah, it's March 1893, off the top of my okay. head. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and then... We know that basically all we have is the little bit of the database from the syndicate world or one that, and that's it. That is it. Mm. So mm. we know that at some point she didn't want to be trained as an assassin. Um, but it was, I believe, a close tragedy that changed her mind into wanting to be trained again. At what point, at what point she then mapped met the man she ended up marrying who was a guy called sam crowder and that is all we know of sam crowder we don't know what he looks like we right. don't even know his date of birth this was a question i was going to ask you louise so his name is mentioned in the database there's very little in the wiki but i was kind of hoping that you were going to tell me i oh, don't worry there's a comic or there's some sort of short nope. youtube animated nope. video or something out there that would tell us a bit about mr crowder but we don't know anything it says a lot that I did a piece for um, Valorian Rue's Codex Toby thing back in October mm. 2021. I did, I think, the legacy prompt for Lydia and Sam. And it's telling that a thousand piece prompt from me has more information and more characterization of Sam than the entire canonical lore. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's kind of just a name in a database because he doesn't turn up. We don't even get like the date of birth. It's just like, oh yeah, they married sometime shortly around 1914, near the start of World War One. Shrug emoji. Uh, what more do you want? Yeah, Declan, you wanted to say something. Um, I was just going to say, looking on the wiki yesterday, I did notice that it said that, um, and I think it's very cliche they did this. I will admit that after the marriage before World War One. Um, he joined British assassins to enlist in the army during World War One, which I know there was national conscription, but it seems like they tried to play it safe by giving him a reason to disappear. So, from a historical standpoint, conscription didn't happen until 1916, which is the is year it? that the thing was ah. set. Yeah. Sorry, World War One historian here. Hi, hello. Um, <laughs> <laughs> until university, World War One and like the end of the Victorian period was like my period. So, um, I feel like we've got the right person for the job. First of all, yeah. a syndicate nerd. Secondly, someone who or has already studied World War One, and thirdly, someone who um, is currently studying archaeology and etc. at university. And so, has been do you know on what? A World War One battlefield archaeology site. Oh my god! Like, brilliant. I've excavated a World War One battlefield. Essentially, it's great. Awesome. Awesome. Um, but yeah, conscription was nineteen sixteen. Um, but I kind of see it in like the typical kind, like the typical character of a man at that time, or especially like the youth, quote unquote, the youth, or like the young fit men of like the Edwardian period. Because when war was declared, there was this massive surge of people um, signing up and having this thing of like, we didn't have the kitchen approaches posters at this point of your country needs you. Like at this point, war was still kind of seen as glorious and kind of seen as a thing. It's like, yeah, it'll be over by Christmas. Get in before the action's over. So there were like millions of sign signups for like Powell's battalions within like the first 24 hours to the first week or so, because they were promised, Oh, if you sign up as a group of mates, you'll all go off to the front together. Which leads to the tragic stories of, you know, families of, of brothers Villages having white, just being wiped, wiped out. out. And in my my town here, uh, I'm sure it's the same in your towns, um, on Remembrance Sunday, which for the, if you're listening and you're not in the UK, um, the second Sunday of November um, is Remembrance Day, where the, the dead of World War One and World War Two, and, and generally those that have fallen in conflict are remembered. And... Um, as part of the service they do in the town centre, the town, the market square in my town, in front of our, our cenotaph, our war memorial, 
um, the they read out the names of the fallen every year for World War One and World War Two, and the number of names they read out with the same surname it just really hits home that that brother after brother after brother was killed, you know, and those parents had mm. they lost not all their children because of course they were daughters but they didn't serve on the front lines they lost all their sons and it really hits hard so could it be possible with this whole um as well in the uh mission you know when winston churchill um begs lydia to infiltrate an eliminate german type of spy facility is it also possible that the assassin's creed team no fault of their own because how small these missions are they could just write Sam Crowder as either just another man who just went to war for glory, or the government could have hired the assassin secretly as a quick fix to end the war. But to me, that does seem like a blanket approach to not give as much information for Sam Crowder as needed. It's just like a quick fix. Mm. like He went off, secret covert mission for the assassins, because it seems uh, Winston Churchill was happy enough to get Lydia's fry's attention to help him so it could be possible that the government knowing some maybe knowing bits about the assassin brotherhood could have used them as hired mercenary off the books off the grid and that kind of covers ubisoft in a way that hmm. you could say all the records of sam crowder and his battalion were lost because they weren't meant to be on the front lines well there were spies in world war one like it's that. not as like it's not as big as like Virginia Hall and the SOE and the OSS in World War Two, um, but there definitely were spies in World War One. All those who it got to a point in the war where people were being executed as spies. Like I think the most famous woman who got ex- executed for the like the perception of being spies was the British nurse Edith Cavill. Like she's the kind of the famous one of like they thought she was a spy because she was helping and stuff like. She may or may not have been one, but like the idea was there, so it's clearly spying was going on, and like people were executed in the Tower of London for you know spying on the Brits during the the Great War, um, as it was known back then. Um, yeah. So the it, war to it, end all wars, which, which <laughs> just yeah. yeah. One thought I had um, about your question, Declan, just to refer back to the the story that we're we're told in the main game of syndicate and it's at the end of the queen victoria missions which are just four short um four or five short missions that they're kind of an add-on after you complete the main story and louise you'll correct my wording here because i don't remember it perfectly but but jacob and evia basically say we you know we, we're happy to help you but we don't agree with empire or we don't agree with your imperial kind of approach to the world so we will be you know we, we're done and that that makes me wonder if with World War One being, you know, effectively an imperial clash, um, would Sam, I mean, to be fair, and Lydia, would they prefer not to get involved, or were they forced to get involved when they realised Templars are either driving the conflict or spying for the Germans? Hence, that sets off the Lydia Fry story. So, I could definitely see Sam signing up and then disappearing, you know, July, August, September time in in nineteen fourteen. Um, or as, as Louis said, maybe working as a spy or a spy hunter somewhere in Europe. But I could also see them not wanting to get involved at all. But we do know from the database that they got married shortly before the war started. Did he decide to, to serve and they got married so that they'd be married before he you know, boarded the train and headed off for basic training or whatever? Mm. Who knows? That's a very good point. Because war, it wasn't a sort of thing of like, oh, Franz Ferdinand was executed, assassinated, not executed, and then war was a thing. It, it took was, weeks, didn't it, to build yeah, up? Yeah, uh, he was assassinated in the last week of July, and England, like the British Empire, declared war late August, pretty much almost a month, six weeks after. Yeah, yeah. So they would have seen it coming. Hmm. Like there could be a fascinating the... story there in that yeah. six-week period of what what machinations were going on between assassins, Templars, and others to try and prevent war or to encourage war. And yeah, there could be a good if... story there, you know, across the whole continent. <laughs> for the, that's for the yeah. writers to think about. Because, like, the vibe, if you want a good, like, in, 
inclination of like the vibe of what was going on. Season one, episode seven of Downton Abbey. Oh, it's yes. like it's that entire like w- like interwar, inter Franz Ferdinand war declared period of like you can see that people are starting to make strategic moves of if they are going to the list like war is inevitable at this point they can feel it coming like people are making plans whether it's like to get into the army so they can get glory quicker or they can be this sort of like I'm just gonna put all my eggs in these baskets and sort of like I'm gonna marry you now so you can get a widow's pension if I die sort of thing that's what I was thinking yeah Louise exactly Go on, Declan. I just want to um, add, and I've just really re- realised now, so I know this is kind of our topic. Um, I did have in my notes, and I just kind of deleted them this morning. It is telling that there is Assassin's Creed Conspiracies, which is a comic book set in World War Two, and I know it's much, much later than World War One, but the Assassins are happy enough to chase after an atomic bomb to, to put a stop to it. So it kind of is telling that if that is their attitude for World War Two to use assassins to stop a Templar threat in the middle of a battlefield, could they have been more primitive in Assassin's oh. Creed One, where instead of like, <clears throat> sorry, I'm coming down with something, like when you um look at the Bayek note from Valhalla, is the point of this, <laughs> um it says that Bayek warned Aya that. The assassins are getting too much to the public eye. They need to go back Ooh. to the shadows. Could it be yeah. telling that maybe this is like the first war something assassins may not be used to because Cassandra technically did take part in a lot of the conflicts in um in Odyssey and I think she would took part in a lot more in the future. So I'm kind of thinking maybe the assassins were new. And they probably saw this as a good powerhouse for them. You know, I know it's a bit of a wrong term to use, but if they hire their brotherhood out to the highest bidder, then they could get a foothold in countries and territories that assassins have never been allowed in by gaining favours. And then they would go off the record, but they must have realised by World War Two that was too much, too primitive. They had to stay secret and help for the good of mankind, not just footholds. So maybe Sam Crowder could have fit into that kind of bracket of let's hire our brotherhoods to give us standings in countries we could never get to before, if that makes sense. Yeah, I say it makes sense. Because the way I sort of this thing, I'm talking about World War Two, but not World War One here, but like the sort of theory still applies of people going into like foreign nations and kind of stealing secrets particularly after world war ii and like the bombings at hiroshima and nagasaki like that information is slowly making its way to the soviet countries and stuff so they had their own like atomic and nuclear energy and weaponry but i can't see a reason why they wouldn't do that during the first world war for different technology like Winston Churchill, um, who Lydia gets to know and may possibly have disagreements with in terms of like suffragette side stuff. Um, He was one of the components that kind of helped develop the modern tank. Yes, yes. So, and like Dardanelle stuff aside and like the Gallipoli campaign aside, um, he helped like develop the tank that was used at the Battle of the Somme that kind of was like somewhat successful it was used it a bit was... too early wasn't it not in great enough numbers i think was is that yeah. right it was kind yeah. of just coming into production at the time of the Somme, and it was only a few yeah so the Somme started the 1st of july 1916 and the tanks debuted on the 1st of september so it was about halfway through the campaign because the campaign right. ended november december around the same time as like the end of the verdun campaign um and yeah Churchill was one of those who kind of helped like get all the stuff together and all the technology but they weren't that very successful but then as they broke down on the battlefield or they were destroyed or captured then like the Germans the Austro-Hungarians and 
like their allies then took the technology, improved on it, and then used it themselves. It happens. If there's superior technology, then surely you are going to use yeah. it. Yeah. It's like Britain, the Brits and the British Empire adapted helmets because the Germans and the Austro-Hungarians had not say, like their um, design of helmets provided more protection than like the soft cap ones they were using at the start of the war. Mm. But <laughs> sorry, I'm going on quite a bit. <laughs> Feel free to butt in. No, but, I um, mean, well, it, it's an interesting time period, and yeah, although but... we think of we think of our games and our stories as sort of traditional assassins versus Templar, there's an awful lot of story that you could create, and it's this story we see in the World War One. What do we call it? Do we call it a rift? Do we call it a sequence? I can't remember what it's called in the game when you when it pops up on the screen. I'm going to call it the World War One story. Anyway, um, there's a lot. It's all about hunting spies. Of course, we we learn at the end of the the sequence that um, the spy might be a bit might be a sage, um, but you could you could tell a really compelling story of espionage. Let's use that word because it's kind of gathering information mm. or retrieving information that's been stolen um, using your assassin abilities. You throw some guys in with red crosses on their on their leather jackets, and you've got instant Templars. You know, carry on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like particularly for World War One and World War Two, mm. there isn't that much that you can ch like you have to change to want to have it in the sort of like espionage, grey and grey morality thing. Yeah, but it was something that Declan said that I kind of want to go back to because it reminded me of something I was going to bring up and something we've spoken about before about the idea of stories. So World War One is kind of like the war for like the first time there is in public consciousness the information comes across the english channel back to britain in about 24 hours you hear about it either the same day or the day after events happen rather than waiting for weeks and like people are writing poetry in the trenches there are like memoirs and stuff and film being utilized for the first time um and like people selling stories to papers and stuff and like mythology really thrives on the battlefield at this point and the one that got my attention when i went over on like a trip which you can do battlefield tours and like battlefield tourism um was the angel of mons it's like it's the ah. one so yes. it's kind of like a fairy tale story from that has kind of different iterations depending on who you ask but the one that was published in a paper was this idea of like a heroic angel guiding i believe british troops through no man's land to safety and there are some iterations like the one i read in a horrible histories book when i was younger is this sergeant seeing his captain lead them through to safety and then turn around and it's like oh wait he died wait hang on but De Declan, you mentioned something about um, like stories and like the assassins actually getting involved and stuff. When I did my rewrite of the Lydia Fry games, or like plotting out a full game for her, what if an assassin is the Angel of Mons? So that this idea of mystifying reality so they don't blow their cover, a la Jack the Ripper? You beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> because. Technically, you're on to one of the biggest things ever is the three tenets of the creed. The three tenets of the creed outline that assassins have got to help people, and during this war, this is like cannon fodder, and you know, some could argue that it's a secret war for the Templars to do horrible stuff, you know, that's how they word it with the um, conspiracy series, you know, there's a secret war behind World War Two for the Templars. So, as you said, there could be a lot of assassins who realize that hang on a minute the freedom of the world hangs in the balance here and we're just puppets for these templars let's save as many lives as we can and maybe the all just went screw it let's not fight templars let's save as many lives as possible and as you said with angel of morn and other stuff the amount of stealth skills they've got you could perceive an assassin as a ghost one minute they're gone, next minute. One minute they're there, they're gone the next. Mm, yeah. I... Let's not forget that her great uncle is the ghost. I was just going to say that, Louise. There is an assassin <laughs> who had that nickname. <laughs> he 
yeah, so I could actually see that being an actual thing that would happen if they did set a story in World War 1. Be intriguing to see how they write it though, because they would have to treat it with more care than they do with any other game, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the closer we get to the present day, and I appreciate World War 1 is, you know, it finished more than 100 years ago, but it's no longer within living memory, and Britain's last World War 1 veteran, I think, died about 10 years ago. I mean, he was well into his, he must have been 110 years old, you know, phenomenal age. So so for, for, for Britain, there may be a few veterans, I don't know if there are any veterans left actually in any countries, but World War One is no longer within living memory. No. Um, but it's not by much. And I think the closer you get to the modern day with your historical segment of the game and the historical story, the more you trip into politics and ideology about yeah. which debate is still continuing and what you said the Declan is right whatever you create as a story and the characters you create and the motivations you've got to be so careful to tell not just tell a good story but be respectful of viewpoints and you know as I say different ideologies I guess World War One is probably an easier story story to tell because it's generally you know imperial families <laughs> slogging it out for mastery of Europe but um or maybe even mastery of different empires but yeah nonetheless it's i still think you need to be very sensitive to to the stories you tell and the, the tragedies that went on um especially early in in world war one there was mm. um there was an a, event known as um the rape of belgium um which again if you you want to be extremely careful if you would wanted to include that in the story because although it's an important historical event it's a fairly unpleasant one and how do you how do you tell it in the right way that is respectful but you know useful for the story? So it's it's a good point, but it's you just got to yeah. be careful. I think it's like I'll touch on this a bit further in like my own discussion of it. But this idea of having like modern games, I know the developers aren't very confident and like very not confident more that that they don't want to touch it. Kind of like I know fans are calling out for a World War Two game, but I don't want it because personally. I really don't. Like, I could see a way you could do it, but I don't like it. I don't like the concept of it because, on one hand, you've got like a very obvious enemy in the Nazis, but on the other hand, you've got you've got genocide having on. You've got people who lived through this. Like, I yeah. remember growing up with my grand stories about the Blitz and saw like her burn marks from an incendiary bomb that landed on their house. Wow! And it's like, no. I don't want to play a game through that. It's like, no, no. My but, uh, just just yeah. as a little aside, but but linked to your comment there. My grandmother uh, was Dutch. Um, she lived in, uh, it's, I guess it's a city or large town of Eindhoven, in the southern part of the Netherlands. And she remembers, and she would tell me stories of the day the Germans arrived, um, and how they used to sort of play pranks on the Germans and spit on the German soldiers who were occupying the town. Um, and she remembers the day when the American parachute divisions landed to free the town. And she can remember the sky, or she remembered the sky being filled with parachutes um, and the joy they felt at their liberation. But yeah, I think that's that's a little too current. And Because mm. the thing you've got to keep in mind is every story, every writer is going to have an intention written into their work. Like, you if you read through, say, Lord of the Rings, you can say that Tolkien is very heavily pro, pro peace because he fought during World War One. He has seen this firsthand. He was at the Battle of the Somme, but he's also like pro nature and like didn't like the industrialization of the West Midlands and Birmingham and things like that during the course of his childhood. But with games as well, as well as you've got a team, you also have like the publishing company and the parent company of. Like, they might have a different way of spinning it, potentially. Yeah. And it may not be like, oh, yeah, war is bad, but you've also got to be like, okay, so we want a war story. No, that's not what we want to tell. Especially with World War One not just being the front, like, it's not just the Western Front. You've also got, like, African fronts. You've got the Dardanelles. You've got um, the Irish Easter Uprising as well that could be touched yeah. upon which yeah. particularly in the uk is dicey territory 
yeah. War at sea, the war in, in the Pacific, I mean. Yeah, Battle yeah, of Jutland, yeah. China and Japan. I don't think the Battle of Jutland would be a very good setting for an Assassin's Creed game. It's quite hard to do parkour from one battleship to another. We might, might skip over that one. Yeah. We'll leave it as a mini game. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Declan, you wanted to say something. Um, I'm just going to go with World of One setting first because um, I really don't know how they could do it for World War Two. But if we were to give Lydia Fry a full game for the time, wouldn't it be safer then to do a continuation of the Helix mission but in a bigger nature? But instead of using war and the horrible nature of war as um, the front of the game, you know, this is game in World One. But maybe as a backdrop, focus on the home front. So for Lydia yeah. Fry, it would be best, you know, a syndicate style gameplay, not RPG. And it would be more about <laughs> protecting the front line, you know. Maybe he could write it as the Templars are trying to get a foothold in England after losing it. So you could have it more of an espionage game set in the UK. I do agree that we do have too many European set games, and I will touch upon that, but. I do think it'd be fairer for a Lydia Fry game if you do not touch the horrors and the, the difficult side of war and have it as a backdrop where you're more focusing on a safe and neutral territory, if that makes sense. And yeah, 100%. Lydia, Lydia Fry, I think, would work a lot better and would be perfect as a syndicate-style, yeah. open-ended UK espionage mission because there is stories of German soldiers you know, trying to find blo um, not just London, I've heard stories about the train come from ports from the west side of England, from Dover, trying to sneak in and mm. you could have missions where she goes over all over London, all over the UK trying to stop different Templar infiltrations, so it's like espionage, but it seems more neutral ground than let's shove her on the front line and Absolutely. probably disrespect somebody by yeah. accident. Well, I tell you, there's, there's, there's a there's a nice sort of segue into that story, um, which comes from the story that we get. And it's one of the notes I wrote here when I was when I was thinking about this episode um, over the last couple of days. And it's a great line because as Louise was sort of giving us a sort of character briefing at the start, we don't know a lot about Lydia Fry. But there's one thing we do know, and it comes from Winston Churchill. When they when they uncover the first radio and she says there's another radio. So she clearly knows there's there's a bigger piece of things a piece of espionage and something going on here but then he says to her if you could put your considerable talents to use you'd have the the gratitude or of a grateful nation or something like that that tells me that she's already known to him or maybe Ooh. to the authorities generally for her skills I've and that heard. to me means that between 1914 or earlier even because she'd probably been active even earlier and when this se sequence starts in 1916 she's been doing assassin stuff which is a great way of setting up a story and i just love the way he said it if you could put your considerable talents and i, I have to say just very briefly louise i know you want to speak and i'm going to shut up in 10 seconds <laughs> um i love the fact that when we start this sequence we are just in a sequence with a fully trained highly skilled assassin with all the abilities and all the tools and we just go bam into the story it's awesome and it, it helped so it, it really yeah it really sparked the imagination and when he said that line he made me think what else has she done tell us more i want to know so louise over to you okay so you were mentioning about winston churchill and stuff and this leans into a segue of all of the rest of my notes that aren't world war one because what if lydia knows churchill because of suffragette stuff so, oh, as in they were on the opposite sides of the suffragette discussion. Yeah, so mean. for people gotcha. who don't know, I get really angry at Winston Churchill's line at the end where he's like, I will go talk to Pres um, Prime Minister Asquith about the right to vote. No, it's a Churchill, bit dumb, isn't it? <clears throat> Winston Churchill was vehemently against British um, like women's suffrage in to the point that he helped pass the 1911 law called the Cat and Mouse Law, which basically... So we all know that suffragettes went on hunger strike, right? When they were in prison and they were released. This yeah. law basically kept an eye on them until they were well enough to go back in. Like a la the cat and mouse nickname. So they would they would let them out of prison to eat and sort of 
healed, regain their and health. And then they would put them back in prison. Yeah. Wow. But Winston Churchill did not like women's suffrage. He spoke out very much against it. So when I when I was younger and first played this game, and I didn't know that, it was very much like, oh, Churchill's on our side. And it's like, yeah, cool, women's suffrage. And now I re- reread it, and it's like, I can't tell if he's just humouring her, or it's like this sort of long-winded of like, yeah, you mentioned this before. Sure, just like, mm. silly rabbit, idealism's for kids. Yeah. But there was yeah. a sort of thing because like London was such a big thing for the suffragette movement, particularly like everyone knows about the Pankhurst, but they weren't London. But there's a biography called Death in Ten Minutes about one of the radical radical suffragettes who was around like the London music halls called Kitty Marion, who can who I probably could see as like one of Lydia's friends or at least an ally in suffragette stuff. It may have gone to like the, I think it's like the Black Thursday, Black Friday protest, where they protested outside of Parliament, 1912, 1913-ish. Mm. And essentially, it's like we see the protesters now, it, it involves quite a bit of police brutality, a disabled woman was thrown out of a wheelchair, like they beat elderly pe- el- elderly women. It was, it was grotesque, it was horrible. And I feel like one of those moments could have been like the catalyst for Lydia switching her mind or like becoming very much like, no, this is the reason why we need to change this. Mm. Mm. I I don't know enough about the suffragette movement to comment, but that line at the end did feel a little, a little too cute. If you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, you know, Churchill is a hero, but in law, during World War II, in the Assassin's Creed law, he helped devise the war for the Templars. In a, like, he had a hand in it. Really? Yeah, in Assassin's Creed II law, Churchill's a Templar. Oh, my word. Uh-huh. <laughs> right, that puts a different spin on things. Is that is that where the writers of this segment of the history didn't check what had already been established in, in Syndicate? I don't know. Or... Because I think that was before conspiracies. So... Um, like he's assassin aligned here that doesn't mean he has to stay assassin aligned he can change that is true that is very true yeah what if it's to the highest bidder sounds daft but if the templars can offer england more prosperity than the assassins can then it's easy enough just to switch over because mm. it looking at winston churchill's records and um, World War Two, especially, came pretty much straight after the Wall Street crash of the nineteen twenties. You know, everyone was struggling. If the Templars can like offer Britain a standing point to prosperity, even if he doesn't agree with their methods or their ways, and he, you know, remembers his time work with Lydia Fry and what her work with the Assassins done, if they can't promise Britain prosperity or help, it's easy enough just to side to the Templars and. Seeing how rich they are now in the games, you can kind of expect them to be sitting on something after the Wall Street crash to keep them in check. Mm. I could see the Templars leaning on a kind of imperial uh, angle. You know, the Templars are the best opportunity for you, Prime Minister, to keep the British Empire together during this difficult, you know, global war we are involved in. Or something like that. I mean, the Empire fell apart fairly quickly afterwards. In the yeah, sort of because next 20 Britain's years, bankrupt. But indeed, yeah. indeed. So, obviously, it didn't work. But I mean, Churchill did he die in the he died in the sixties? Didn't he? He died in the sixties, uh, early sixties, after the like Great Smog, I believe, which was the early sixties. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but there's no saying that something like that didn't happen during the World War One game. Mm. Perhaps on a different mm. front in the Empire, like. Um, so I want to know where Henry is because in canon he just disappears after the Locust comics which is set in 1872 I was like we know he's back in India at some point like around that time there's the photograph in the Jack the Ripper DLC where he, Evie, Jacob and Jack are mm. at the temple of Carly can but- we just pause, just pause you very briefly there Louise um, I, I know this stuff but you know how I know this stuff is because I've listened to your episode 
about Henry Green. So if you're listening to us right now, you should know that Louise also is a podcast host and you should check her out on YouTube. What is the channel, Louise? It's just my name. It is just Louise (laughs) Chase. (laughs) Okay. The Rookery's Archives. That's the name of the podcast. And she did an excellent episode recently all about Henry Green. And uh, what you're, it's it's just nothing. It's just blank, isn't it? Is he alive? Yeah. Is he chilling? Is he assassinating? Who knows? (laughs) Yeah. It's like, because he grew up, I believe he, I swear. Okay, so it's been a while since I've even looked at my notes on Henry. So this is all from memory. But he was born in Amritsar, I believe, which is like a big, rich city in mm. India. Like India-Pakistan border, I believe. Um, but in 1919, or like the fallout after the First World War, like, I don't know the ins and outs of this, so it might be a little bit of a difficult topic to step to. But it is sort of like the, like, there was sort of like a fallout there, like an uprising against the Brits. And I yeah. wonder if Henry was okay. Like, did he get, like, if he and Evie had children, did they get out okay? Were his family okay? Sort of. I just want to know if he's alive. <laughs> it's funny because he's not mentioned at all in Jack the Ripper. Besides that um, photograph, no. Yeah, exactly. Um, so um, I nearly said Lydia then. Evie returns to London in, in what does it be, October or November 1888? So the double event was September and she right. was there late October because yeah. if we take Evie finding, killing Jack and rescuing Jacob on the same day as Mary Kelly was killed, it's the 9th of November, aka their birthday. Of course, yeah. So she gets this this urgent dispatch same day. to return on, yeah. and she arrives in uh, in Scotland Yard with uh, with Inspector Aberline. That story takes place only over a few days, doesn't it? The Jack the Ripper story that we yeah, keep playing the game. So it'd be two early or three days, a, a week at most. But bearing in mind that with with transport to and from India, mm. it would take about a month to get there. Yes. Bearing in yes. mind, like, you've also got to include the week or so the letter may take to get there mm. and, like, booking passage and setting affairs in order. I feel like the Evie just dropped everything and ran. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. her brother is in trouble. I am going to save you and deal with this shit. But what's a shame is we get no knowledge of Henry from no. that story. Not even, like, Not even one line of how is henry or anything so we yeah. don't know where he is he could be fine he could be and dead Abeline calls know. her miss fry as well i so. know <laughs> it's hilarious so I, I like the idea that she kept her maiden name like she i'm like yeah she's either fry or fry mere oh wow that sounds good it's like she um double barrels her surname because i feel like evie's that kind of person who's like nope my surname i'm keeping and henry would like 100 percent support that but i just want to know if he's okay <laughs> Yeah. It's like, yeah. There's just so much we don't know about the fries and like having like the Lydia bit. If it was a full game, it would be a really good way to expand this because there's like bits about Lydia's personality and stuff that I don't feel like she's an only sibling. I feel like this sort of tragedy they touched upon was either one of her parents or like an older sister. So there's a fic that I have planned. Mm. Yeah. A fanfic or like a right through of a Lydia game where she is like, an, she is the second set of Fry twins. She and her older sister. But her older sister dies like early World War One, maybe the Titanic. Haven't decided yet. And it's like that sort of like kind of thing that. I don't know. See, this is the thing. They don't tell us we have to guess or write it in ourselves. <laughs> Go on, Declan. So, here's a little theory for you guys. See mm-hmm. how you like this. So, the basic consensus now we're hearing is Henry Green, missing, no details. Lydia Fry, who has, judging by the wiki, the gameplay, one of the most interesting points to discuss for Assassin's Creed and the most important, well, interesting point of history to touch on if done right and, you know, 
fairly, is it possible that the reason why we didn't see nothing afterwards and why she's so, she was ghosted is because of Juno? And by that, Juno at the end does intercept the message and she has that, you know, line, once I walk the earth as you do, I was born to eliminate cast in the city of Finia in the year 2195 of the Isu era, then the whole e Juno stuff was dropped completely to the comics and we were stuck with Assassin's Creed Origins soft rebooting essentially. So is it possible that the dropping of the Juno arc into comics kind of got rid of the Dear Fry's opportunity? Because that whole Darkest Hours, the mission, the Darkest Hour, did have a lot of Juno feel to it, you know. It did. It, especially yep. the transcript. So did they really accidentally rely too heavily on Juno to do the mission as an overcast and have Lydia Fry added? And there's so much detail and lore that shows Lydia was so fleshed out that she was due a sequel because of that, in my opinion, that they dropped it because they dropped everything to do with Juno. I have a thought on this, and I'm going to say it, and then maybe, Louise, you'll, you you will have a comment on what yeah. I say. I was going to so, say, you go first, and I'll counter-argument if need be. Okay, so let's let's briefly remind people listening that, at least until very recently, we hope things have changed for the better, um, but we know that Ubisoft's sort of chief editor or chief creative officer uh, Serge Hascoway, not a fan of female protagonists, um, a very unpleasant person generally, as has been reported. Um, what we learned from news articles published in the summer of 2020 is that the original plan for Syndicate was either Jacob and Evie to have equal screen time or for Evie to have more screen time. Um, and as you play the story, there are certain missions that are for Jacob and certain missions that are for Evie. Just in the last few days, I, I was sent a copy um, because I'd been wanting to add it to my collection of the Syndicate fan kit. Um, and when I looked at the content, I'm very grateful to the person that sent it to me. Um, but when I looked at the content, it kind of it didn't half make me angry because it's all Jacob and his gangs, Jacob and his rooks. And... <sighs> What I'm wondering is, and this is what we'll never know, we'll never get the true answer, but I'm going to speculate now. The writers, the games that we get, the ones that we know were kind of directly impacted by the sexism, as far as we know, is, is Syndicate, Origins and Odyssey. What I wonder is, the writers, the developers wanted to tell either a balanced story between the Tit Twins or a more Eevee-heavy story. When that was overruled, did they try to find a compromise where they could tell a female protagonist story, but the way they got the compromise was to move it into a, a quote unquote rift or simulation or simulation within the simulation. So we get Lydia Fry as our single playable female protagonist, but because she's in a rift, you know, she avoids the, uh, the scrutiny from the, the very senior people at Ubisoft. Um, and that was how the writers tried to tell the story they wanted to tell originally, but, but you know, delivering the game that they had to deliver. Because I do appreciate that these games are always compromises, technically, story, gameplay. There's always compromises, but there's a particularly unique compromise within some of the recent Assassin's Creed games in terms of the gender of the protagonist and, you know, do women play video games? Turns out they do. Um, so that's that's my thought, is maybe the sequence was added to, to, to help the, because the writers wanted to tell that story and perhaps that it wasn't done very thoroughly or maybe they kind of just used Juno as a bit of a MacGuffin or whatever to drive the plot. So maybe it doesn't make too much sense when it's analysed in, in great depth. That, that's my thought. What do you think, Louise? Yeah, that kind of touches on something like the point that I was going to bring up because I thought, uh, yeah, like that sort of typical more reliance on promoting male protagonists particularly Ezio like uh -huh. Ezio's their boy okay <laughs> um and as much as I love Jacob I find Evie more interesting character because of like the weight of the stuff that you can tell she has the love and attention given to her like I think I read at one point that it was originally an Evie game and then they got 
they had to add Jacob in. Because they were like, no, 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 people don't right. want a female protagonist. So what are you talking them. about? <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> so there was that. And then um, there was also this concept art I saw of, I know Declan mentioned the Unity Rifts earlier, which is sort of what Lydia's piece feels like. Hmm. Where it was like phone box, like the red phone box is synonymous with London now being entryways into that sort of time rifty thing happening for syndicate so like london in different periods um which baby lydia was supposed to be a little bit of a less there was supposed to be like more of these sort of things maybe they following different generations of the fry family in into like maybe like the 1960s and the mod culture or back. A, fry, a fry descendant on a Lambretta. That would be awesome. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> or like Ethan and Cecily. Like going backwards as well. Like I just want angry Welshwoman, angry Welsh blonde Cecily Fry <laughs> punching Ethan for being a bit of a dick. Just give it to me. I need to see Ethan punched. Thank you. But it's this idea of. I feel like there was supposed to be something more. Whether Lydia was supposed to be the next game or not, or like it wasn't supposed to be that big at all, and they like cut things out for time. Because I know people have said that Syndicate feels very rushed. Because at this point, oh, really? we still had. Did a, people say that? A, yeah, I've had a p few people say to me that it feels unfinished, that it feels like they had bigger things planned for it. Like, hmm. I know in one of like, I hate mentioning leaks, but I have to mention this. There was like this concept art of. Jacob in the coat that George Westhouse wears, handing his hat to, um, like a rook ally, so he can go and change into a different outfit depending on like the circumstances. A la Aveline de Grand Prix. Oh, the persona system, yeah. my favorite unused system. <laughs> yeah, that would have been a great thing to bring back. But, and then I was recently reading through the concept art book for Syndicate. And it's like they've got all these different like looks for Evie, all these different like possible like assassins that aren't just the twins or aren't just Henry or aren't just Lydia. That it felt like there was like this recruitment system or more you could have done in some of the like Lambeth Asylum or in World War One. That they felt like there was so much more they could have put in, but they just mashed mm -hmm. two together and got it out so they could have the mm -hmm. annual release system. I have, a th I have a few thoughts. Um, sorry, Declan. I'll just say two quick points, then I'll, I'll shut up and hand over to you. Um, th Syndicate's a very polished game. Everything works. We, I mean, I, I, all jokes about Unity aside, um, I can compare Unity on PC and Unity on PlayStation 5. And on console, it is Unity is definitely more glitchy. Just movement. Maybe it's me. I don't know, but combat everything is a little more on pc it's very very reliable but unity on launch was pretty bad yeah we've all seen I, those bugs yeah <laughs> I, do, I, I would love to know and again we'll never know this but we can speculate i wonder how ambitious syndicate was and whether as, as they approached the release date of unity and they the dev teams realized the state it was in i mean the, the true or not so should have been delayed the release but anyway they didn't I wonder if Unity was scaled back, not not because, maybe not for editorial or writing reasons, but for technical reasons. And they decided just to delete segments of the planned gameplay so they could focus on fewer gameplay modules, but make them work reliably. Yeah. So focus your dev resources on. I mean, there's a lot in Syndicate anyway with the ships and the carriages and the, the gang fights and recruitment of, of your your. Um, your rooks but so there's lots of systems in there yeah maybe they did wonder... delete systems just for to focus on quality who knows yeah. it makes me wonder what they could have been like yeah we have the rook recruitment system but what if it could have been something like evie makes this comparison in game of jacob treating this liberation of london like Etsy liberating rumor but what if we could have done exactly the same thing, like recruited like Clara or one of the urchins or some of the rooks that have done very, very well and progressed into becoming novice assassins and then up through that sort of ranking system too. 
go on Declan you wanted to say something um, I just wanted to um, agree to Louise's point where um, people have said like Syndicate does feel a little bit rushed and I'm really going to sound so super nerdy, nerdy for saying this but whenever I play an Assassin's Creed game I spend a good hour or two hours checking everything out from the skill trees the world and everything and looking at the skill tree uh, to me the way the skill tree works in syndicate for like the rook's abilities seems just slapped on seemed like it should have been bigger but it wasn't because half the stuff looked like generate income and then looking at the stuff that generates income it's like well there's not really a lot to buy with their income so what income system was missing because i feel like there was an income system missing and I know I have not played the Lydia Fry mission, and I know if I play it, it might feel different, but from watching it a few times on YouTube, it feels like that was part one, and there should have been like part two or part three, so maybe from the leaked concept out of the red phone box is that maybe the Lydia Fry had like a two, three part story, but it just got overly ambitious, because as you said with Unity's launch and everyone was buggy then, they needed a clean, next game needed to be clean, and it was just overridden because everyone had yeah. bad taste from Unity. So mm. I still think from when I play Syndicate that there is a lot missing, and I feel like all the collectibles were added last minute to give players more to do because, not to be rude, the beer bottles, the flower presses are just too much you know there are a lot of collect i mean there's a lot of chests in paris but there are a l- there's 380 something chests in syndicate and i'm about halfway through opening them all <laughs> I'm, I'm currently on my attempt at 100 percent run <laughs> syndicate yeah i i ended up having to use i ended up having to use the official guide to get them all like in in the game you can buy like the collectible maps but and just to clarify, still... you don't buy them from the Helix store. You can buy them with your in-game, with in-game currency. In-game currency yeah. yeah, that's what I've done. I've bought all the yeah. maps in-game from the the vend- street vendors. But there's so yeah, it's like the Michel Rouge vault. It's just there. You've got all these um, music boxes around London. Mm-hmm. Why? Where's the law? Can I have yep. the law behind Michel Rouge's vault, please? Who is Michel Rouge? Why did he go mad? Um. Was it Juno's fault? Was he also a sage? I wanted to keep this locked away so that influence was held Good away point. from him. Good point. If if you uh, are listening to this and you worked on the development of Assassin's Creed Syndicate, do feel free to drop us a postcard with uh, answers to these questions about the development <laughs> of the game and the compromises and the cut content that might have explained all this. Also feel free Think... to DM me on Twitter because I am very interested. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the other signs that something was cut and Correct me if I'm wrong for thinking like this, but when you look at Syndicate, and I know it should have been an AV Fry game, but they try so hard, especially because I got the gold edition and I saw the DLCs, they try to level the gear system out so there was enough gear for AV as Jacob. But I always find it weird why there's no Isu outfit for Jacob at all, mm. but it's there for AV. Now, I don't think that's a bad thing because I think Eevee's is phenomenal but all games in the series give us an unlockable for a new armor outfit i find it weird and i do agree with you louise why music boxes i did understand that why the vault and i know you can visit the vault with jacob but why wasn't there something as a reward for both characters it just feels he does comment doesn't he when you finally unlock it he does say something like is there nothing in there that will fit me or something like that doesn't he which is great it feels like you you would look a right tit in it line that's it thank you louise true siblings (laughs) no maybe it's just me i I do feel like there was something missing for jacob and i know people may be saying well it's better that evie got something because it was meant to be her game i do agree but when you've got a gear system where the even the DLC has like free DLC outfits for Jacob and free for Evie. It's like there's no explanation for the vault at all, and I really don't understand yeah. what the law behind Evie's Isu outfit is. Anyways, you know, there's also there's... stuff in later lore they could have used to utilize that because, like Assassin's Creed Valhalla, also returns to London or 
rather huh. syn- syndicate returns in like canonical linear time that weird soupy thing um but there is that assassin's vault beneath london and i've looked at the map before and seen it roughly in the area of the ta- where the tower of london would be erected yeah. about 300 years after avor and the whole danes law and the events of Valhalla, but it's still there potentially. Why couldn't the twins, or like, because they both go and visit, or Eve, or not Evie, or Lydia, who has that as free roaming locations, mm. albeit very limited in areas of the tower that you can visit. Besides stuff that you visit as Evie and then Jacob during the DLC mission. Um. Why couldn't it have been under the tower and then have something else and more lore and connect, like, connecting just little bits? So you're saying you'd like to have seen references in Valhalla that would kind of call forward, if you like, to Syndicate? Yeah, not in the way of... Not sort of in the way of, like, shoving your face in it. No, no. Not in the way of the Hobbit of I know a young man once called Strider sort of way, but more in the <laughs> kind of gentle of oh, if they'd gone down this thread or looked this way, pot- potentially Jacob could have found this in the 20 years between the Syndicate and the DLC. Gotcha. Or in the 50 years between him and his granddaughter kind of way. Or potentially Cecily could have found it. We don't know what she did as an assassin. We don't know what Ethan did. Maybe they, the only that could have been only, their mission. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, maybe the only reference we got was the fact that Crawley exists in Valhalla as a tiny little hamlet south of London. Yeah, um, I was kind of hoping for like a little hidden pocket watch embedded in a rock somewhere in Crawley or something like that, which I know is a very obvious Easter egg, but it would have been fun. Hey, there was a TARDIS in Origins. That's true. That's true. So they could have f- found a way to to squeeze Evie's pocket watch somewhere into yeah. into a a, a straw like, hut in in Crawley, <laughs> or two rooks sitting over this one particular like carriage or something. Oh, that would have been awesome. Some rooks. Oh, ah, yeah. that's a much, that's a much more artistic one than mine. That's great. Do you know that reminds me of something? So was it last week? Or where, was it when? Because Declan and I did a live stream last Sunday, mm-hmm. and I and now you're going to correct me if I was wrong here, Louise. <laughs> I blew Declan's mind when I said that it was Victoria Atkin, Evie's actor, who kind of suggested that Evie would always have a pocket watch on because of her precision and her planning. Did I remember that correctly from a fan interview or something with with Victoria Atkin? I'm not sure, but it feels like such a Victoria thing because mm. I know she was adamant of doing the mocap in high heel boots. That was my other correct. fact that I was going to tell Declan and I forgot to tell him on the stream. Thank you. So say it again. Go on. So Blow Declan's mind again. <laughs> we, know that Evie, we know that Evie, as all Victorian ladies would do, wears like raised boots, like high, we'd call them high heel boots now with the like, um, I can't think of the word. The like inverted so like a, heel. Like a kitten heel. Yeah. Do you call it that? Maybe not. Oh, dress storings are coming for me. I can't remember. But yeah, it's like this like two, one and a half, two inch heel on boots, which was kind of standard. But she was adamant that for the mocap to look right, she would do all the mocapping, including all the parkour stuff and all the cutscenes with the boots on. Or with like raised heeled boots on, so it mm. would look accurate rather than potentially looking a bit iffy when going from flat to raised feet. I'm assuming normally when they do mocap, they're just wearing all that they, they wear those kind of all in one neoprene or later. What are they? What would they be made from? Oh, um, it's spandex just looks, like suits, yeah. isn't it? So I'm guessing they're normally flat footed. Yeah, spandex with baubles. But yeah, she did Victoria it all with Atkins. Heels also does quite a lot of mocap stuff like she has her own mocap centric podcast mm. and does like um like master classes and stuff so she's like sort of a professional like well she is a professional <laughs> but like it's that like extra level of care that it's kind of like yeah 
you're very much Evie. I love this. I respect yeah. that. So there we are, Declan. That was the second Evie fact that I forgot to tell you last week. That now Louise has filled in the gaps. <laughs> I'm just blown away by the dedication from a voice actor. Like, not to be rude, if you're a character in the game, you don't really have to put that much effort in. Just show up, act your damn best. That's it. But to come in like, nope, I'm wearing red shoes. Do parkour scenes in it because it needs to look right. It's blooming awesome. Like, I don't awesome. think I could do yeah. that dedication. Like, give her props for that. That's epic. Well, let, let's clarify. They're not just voice actors. They are performance capture actors. Because yeah. they do it all face Mark capture, Kathy. body capture, voice capture, all with the, the dots. Have you, have you seen the pictures, Declan, where they have all the little dots drawn on their faces to give the animators the reference like map? Of their... I'm, I'm not smart enough to understand this sort of thing, so I just leave it to professionals to tell me in simple terms how mocap works. If you are a professional Long mocap story, artist, yeah. do be, do do write to us and we'll get you on the show. <laughs> I, I would love it's, that. It's very much more theatre than cinema mocapping, because you are just acting out scenes at a time that they just so happen to be recording in this open space. Like it may be cut and go to different like camera angles for prosperity but well capping is basically just theater and i yeah. love that it's great it's awesome to see like and then when they do like the the side by side um videos where they show the the mocap um actors in the volume as it's called mm. and then they show you the final rendered sort of animated scenes it is i think the whole technology end to end is stunning um I wanted to return briefly to Lydia, if we may. Yeah, sorry, um, that was a bit of a tangent. No, it's, well, that's, hey, that's what we're all about. I mean, let's be honest, there isn't a lot of content that we know directly about Lydia, so we have to extrapolate and, you know, wander off on, yeah. on tangents. Can we plus talk about you Lydia? Spoke, you, plus, you brought me in to talk about fries. It was bad. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what, carry on. Can we talk about Lydia's pretty awesome sort of, khaki green military interpretation assassin robes with that I wonderful love... big baggy hood which i think is just awesome i love that coat so much i want to make that coat it's so good because it's like the like um the khaki of like tommy uniforms of the british army at that point mm. it's, mm. it blends in remarkably well like london with all of its like military coming to and fro and people on leave and such if you saw her in a crowd you would just you wouldn't really notice her would you you wouldn't Do you know, i've just had a thought by that point were, were i'm guessing food would have been rationed because yeah convoy attacks started mm -hmm. in 1915 u-boat warfare yep yeah and the germans went back and forth on whether it was open warfare or unrestricted the lusitania was sunk and the americans got cross and all the rest of it were clothes rationed? Would she have had to make her robes from kind of standard rationed military uniforms? Oh. Would... There's, a, there's something to add to your future writing. But I love the green and the gold detailing. And then you've got that lovely kind of, I guess it's like metallic, the assassin symbol on the, the sort of between the shoulder blades at the back. Mm. It looks incredible. I love the whole look of her outfit. It's so nice. Yep. I have it many good pictures of it. also feels like... Feels like there's like homage to her, like the people who trained her in it as well, because it feels like that sort of like there's a sense of regality to it that screams Evie, but also like you've got the pouches with like what would have had the voltaic bombs and bullets in, yes. and like the cookery and stuff that is just like mm, that's her grandfather. Love yep. that. It was a nice blend of the two of them, wasn't it? um in that and she's got i don't know if you've noticed this but so where she's got the long tails um where they meet at the sort of the small of the back she's got this little i don't know what you call it i'm not a clothing expert she's got like a black lace puff and evie has the same thing on her simply evie I costume think, as well i think it's called a plum bum okay but, she has a plum bum there you go or <laughs> There's something a like that <laughs> that may be the latin for lead but it's something similar to that all right it's like right. a little it's a little pleated bit of fabric that goes under like a little bit of lace kind of tidy up a coat right and i just love the fact that it matched what um yeah. what evie has on her outfit as well it was a nice little detail because there's 
there's something I wrote in the Codex Toba thing I did for Sicily. It's mm. either Sicily, Evie, or Lydia's one that I did, where the coat starts off as base, like everyone, like the um, uniforms in AC1, where it's just you get a coat, you are one in a thousand. You are Assassin 24601. <laughs> nice nice reference but, we could sing you. it if you like <laughs> um but like over time as they become more confident and they rise up and they become they go from novice to just an assassin to master to mentor to a grand mentor mm. they like personalize their coats so going back to what you said of like maybe it was just a standard issue coat what if Lydia personalized this coat intentionally to homage people. Like yeah. she wanted it to look a little bit different because it reflects on the person wearing the coat. And like reflects on like I quite like that, but it also works for me or I want this bit of detailing because aesthetic because sometimes as Oscar Wilde would approve, sometimes you've got to do stuff for aesthetic. Absolutely. I'm wondering, does she? I'm going to check my pictures. Does she wear a sash? She like, has like traditional belts. assassin sort of belt. Hmm. Oh, I'm going to op open up some. I shared a few pictures on Twitter in the last few days. If if people are listening and follow oh, us through damn it, on her Twitter, coat's but... closed. You can't tell. No, that's interesting, she... isn't it? Mm. She doesn't wear that traditional kind of. Because I was wondering, would there be any of the Indian influence? Like maybe some yellow mm. from like him, the, the sort of sash that Henry wears, but there isn't, is it? It's the green with the the gold braid. You wouldn't call it gold braid. What would you call it? That's that's brocade. Brocade. Okay, that's that's all over the coat. And then she's got that metal torque, hasn't she, around the neck, which yeah. is really fascinating. This solid metal band around the neck. That looks really uncomfortable, but if it works for her, then yeah, fair does. enough. It's, yeah, it does look uncomfortable. But hey, look, the, these assassin ladies, they can parkour in heels. I'm sure they can uh, They can cope yeah, with a little bit. Yeah, bear in mind that <laughs> both Evie and Lydia would be wearing, like, corsets and, like, bust bodices while also doing parkour. I want to I talk briefly about corsets because, again, during Codex Toba, uh, one of my friends, uh, Murray Claude, she, for the myth prompt for codex toba she wrote a great thread about corsets I and corset that. myths I you read it. it yes and she called out very specifically the section of the main game in syndicate where you get the prompt in in the final mission a night to remember where it says evie's movements are restricted by her dress and then it later on not. she says get me out of this infernal contraption now i get from a gameplay point of view the developers wanted to strip away your tools and your parkour so that you had to be stealthy i get that mm -hmm. but that scene is as go on louise take it away corsets did they really restrict movement well ba they were basically sports bras right like it's it's like wearing a bra that's just a little bit longer mm. effectively like maybe like you know when you wear a sort of really tight coat for a bit and you stop feeling it but like it's a little bit iffy to bend over a bit mm. it could be mm. like that but there were also things like equivalent of like sports corsets there were pregnancy corsets where you could adjust the size with ribbons on the like the left and the right side as like pregnancy belly swelled and stuff um, oh, okay. and there were like um ones for house servants who would be bending over or doing more strenuous activities that were designed for this sort of thing. So Evie wouldn't be restricted from that in their day-to-day -day activities. I think it's more the dress because right. you've got so many layers. You've got like the crinoline as well and you've got like the bodice and like where are her gloves? Side note, where are her, gl <laughs> where are her gloves? <laughs> That was a point when we were doing our um, Elise de la Serre episode last October. That was a point that Marie Claude made, which was it's January. They've gone to the execution of Louis the Sixteenth. Why is Elise not wearing damn sleeves? For God's sake, she'd be freezing. But yes, anyway. <laughs> but um, like I can't climb in a dress. I wouldn't be able to climb in a dress, so I can see why they would want to restrict her movement that way. But mm. to argue it with like an infernal contraption of like a corset no like mm. it's like women wearing bras now mm. they're personalized and you can get them done and they are quite comfortable 
you if you pick the right one. Um, yeah. Speaking of someone who does wear a bra, um, it's but, probably not uh, a topic Declan and I have direct experience on. <laughs> but that's why you're here. But, but I tell um, you, just just for the gentlemen like, listening, um, felt... something that, that I, I learned was that men would wear them. Um, cavalry men would wear them to support the back. Um, oh which I think was, again, was in Mary Claude's thread, which we should probably find and retweet so people yeah. can read it. But yeah, it wasn't just for the ladies. It was about supporting the body and I guess helping support the weight of what you were wearing. So anyway. Yeah. It's like there are plenty of threads of people out there who in the 21st century have worn corsets or bust bodices as they would have been recreated now. Mm. Like in re- like historically recreated, there are people all over YouTube who does do this. Like Bernadette Banner, I've seen her do one that she personalized for her spine because she has oh, wow. scoli- she has like scoliosis so it is quite right. curved and she like personalized it for, for like support and stuff those that can be done it doesn't have to be rigid and uncomfortable and this idea of fainting and fainting couches that you see quite often <laughs> it's like it's like skinny supermodels now it's so prevalent and stuff like that because it's so stupid it's like you see in media now and like in like caricature cartoons like this isn't just a isn't a daily thing it's just it's just a thing that is so prevalent because people are just like this is ridiculous what are they doing or it's like the height of fashion but not everyone's going to be doing it and (laughs) going back to the dress she wouldn't tight lace she'd tight lace enough to be supported but comfortable able to breathe able to run but Oh, I had a point about that dress that I was going to make and I've forgotten it. Yeah. It'll come. We'll yeah, edit it in, don't worry, seamlessly. Point. <laughs> I've, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. I've got it. <laughs> it's the idea that I think Evie's just uncomfortable with wearing dresses rather than it mm. being cu- uncomfortable in the situation. Like, if she's grown up with, like, this idea of practicality, like, four layers of crinoline and a bustle and a dress and the cage and... You're essentially waddling if you're uncomfortable and are un- un- unfamiliar with the environment. Yeah, I wouldn't want to wear it too. Yeah, understood. Declan, would you like to comment on Lydia Fry's epic outfit? Um, I'm just sad that we only got one outfit. I think it would be pretty cool to yeah. have more outfits. But I think that's just for my need that... I, and again, this is just a comment I can only make from watching YouTube and checking the wiki, so I can't comment because I've not played it. But from watching it, I just do think that there should have been more to Lydia Fry's character and Lydia Fry's mission because the mission looked too short. It looked hella fun. And really, I think I'm now just really wanting a syndicate game again that's just... Lydia Fry's mission, but bigger with syndicate mechanics, because really you could not do a syndicate uh, Lydia Fry World War One espionage mission with RPG mechanics. It's just impossible. Nobody, and this is a guy who doesn't mind RPG games, but nobody wants a skill tree for espionage missions. No one wants a skill tree for stealth or physical combat. Just give us syndicates mechanics but tighter for a lady for a game and I'll, I'll be happy yeah that that sequence playing i mean what is it it's only five memories or, or five is it five different individual hunts you have to do and then there's the master spy hunt it yeah. was so much fun i loved it it was really it wasn't too challenging i'm not a specially skilled gamer but that world they created the tiny tiny map I'm just around Tower Bridge. I I thought that was one of my, that was one of the most enjoyable sort of standalone sequences that I've played in this in this franchise. It really was. And everything mm. about that map, that section of the map, world builds spectacularly. Yeah, I think because you've got like the idea of like the Zeppelin raids would happen during like 1915, 1916. So that quite like little income activity was quite nice to see. Um, But you've also got, like, the letters you would see. You've got the recruitment posters. You've got the idea of these assassin, like, these Templars and, like, the spy hunt happening. For people who just look normal. Like, they aren't 
like Crawford Starrick level. They're not um, Cheshire Borgia. They are a nurse, or they are a spy, or they are a Tommy. They are. Were, were they sort of hiding in plain sight? Would we say? <laughs> yeah, taking the leaf out of their enemies' books. <laughs> Absolutely. It's just so well blended in for like the limited amount of bit we've got and like the atmosphere of like the color grading and the color of the skies Thank versus you for mentioning like that. how it's amazing versus like how clear syndicate can be is like how, how like syndicate is very like middle of the industrial revolution victorian britain it's going to be a bit murky but it feels different when you enter world war one enter that rift because of like how blood red the sky looks it just feels like a little bit dangerous you're always sort of walking around like you're in london so you'll know you're safe but there's just that little thing about it that just feels like i'm just going to double check and sort of keep an eye out like everyone is on edge everyone is on nerve because war is happening and they're no longer distant from it at this point yeah there's that i'll just very briefly make a point about the the opening cut scene so you you approach the rift on the thames you you go into the rift merge with the rift whatever the right word is and the very first few frames of the opening cut scene is just a dead body slumping over and then lydia retracting her blade and she just looks over her shoulder at the the body that's sort of falling off the table and there's just something about that. I guess you'd call it a cold open. Boom. She has just killed someone and she's there in the action. And it's just fantastic. I love that that entry, that opening into the story. Um, we are in the middle of the action. Um, I'll make two more quick points. Using, I don't know if they're supposed to be electrical poles or telegraph poles. I'm assuming electrical poles. They open up some nice parkour and traversal mm. opportunities, which is pretty cool. And there's a new mechanic. There's the, the generator or the electrical generator mechanic where you can disable or enable a generator to draw attention to you, um, either to move guards around or bring them to you and, and then assassinate them. So two little sort of, let's quote unquote modern day, because I appreciate 1916 isn't really modern, but it just little ways that, that more modern industrial society could open up assassin-y gameplay. Um, and I, I thought it was excellent. I really, it's, I tell you, just to make a general point, and I, I maybe we'll talk about Jack the Ripper DLC in the future because I have lots of thoughts on that. I think Syndicates, I, I really enjoyed Syndicate. It seems to not get so much attention. I, there's definitely questions about the story, maybe the execution of the story. But I think Syndicate's add-on content, I think Jack the Ripper DLC is amazing. I think the Lydia Fry story is really enjoyable. I really like the dreadful crimes. I've, I've actually completed those before. I'll be doing them again. Um, I think Syndicate's got some of the best or most interesting and varied add-on content um, yeah. of these games. Um, I think they there's, a bit of it, there's some gems. Of, they all have that sort of atmosphere about them. Like they might have like a Shark Holmesy vibe, or they might be a little bit of like the touching on the imperialism that was mm. felt with uh the maharaja who is henry's great uncle and that's yes. never touched upon but you've also got like on the flip side you've got sort of secondhand nerve of you know you're in a war zone essentially and then you've got just the downright horror that is jack the ripper dlc it's like yeah. each one of these feels yeah. vibrant and just so different from like what is the happiest ending of an Assassin's Creed game. <laughs> That's a good point. It was like, neither of the twins die. Henry doesn't die. They reclaim London. Happy La Harry, La Happy Larry. And but, they get knighted. Um, <laughs> yeah, and inducted to the Order of the Garter, which is absolutely limited numbers. I is think it 25? Number... Something like that, it's or even smaller. 24, 25, it's very, very limited numbers. I'm going to Google it. It's the most noble order of the garter, isn't it? Yeah, the order of the garter. I'm Googling it with my very loud keyboard right now. So this will be nice background <laughs> noise for the uh, for the podcast. The most noble order of the garter. 
There's definitely 24 living members. So there we are. And two of them were fries at one point. <laughs> so there we are. Two fries and a mirror. Yep. Yep. <laughs> but even that opens up possibilities for things like, sorry, Declan, I know, um, like... <laughs> I'm, so sorry. I'm, I'm a bit worried Declan, Declan might be asleep we'll carry on we'll just hit end recording when, when we he's probably nodded off and he's slumped over his keyboard um, <laughs> oh no I'm so sorry but um, it's like they have this connection with you know the royal family for as long as it lasts and they have the connection with you know whether it's familial or on a working basis with the last Maharaja and his family at this point, he had a daughter called Sophia, or Sophia, who was a f one of the most famous suffragettes in, the, in Britain, to the point that, like, when her father died, um, she continued doing suffragette stuff. And they couldn't arrest her. They couldn't, like, put her under arrest because she was under protection from Queen Victoria and then later her son. So it's like, I feel like Liddy would have known about her because... There would be like some family tree distant relations and then it's like oh common goal i see you let's team up and then it's like maybe like jacob and henry 2.0 kind of vibe i quite hmm. like that <laughs> <laughs> jacob did not like henry at the start of syndicate did he he really did at not. the end of syndicate <laughs> like brothers-in-law vibes of yes like chaos yeah. versus a little bit of okay this is happening Let's just continue. Can so I just... I think, as, sorry, uh, Declan, mate. Sorry. <laughs> James, go on. I've got one quick question and I want to ask Louise to clarify. And I wrote it down here when she was giving us the intro to Lydia Fry's family okay. and, and relations. Now, mm -hmm. I, I've been keeping you and others updated on my, my replay of Syndicate. And there's things I missed. I, I don't see very obvious clues. So... Jacob is Lydia's grandfather. Yes. Now, when I first played Syndicate, I, I missed some clues. And so let me ask you to clarify. Is Jacob gay or bisexual? Is it really tr likely that he would have um, had a child with a woman? Because I'm, I'm not clear, to be honest. So clarify for me, what, what is his sexuality? Canonically, he is bi. Okay. But the only, like, quote-unquote romance angle we have with him is with Maxwell Roth. So I can yeah. see why you'd get that kind of, like, he's gay vibes. I, but, I completely um, missed it the first time. I assume Maxwell just kissed him because he was about to die, and why not? But, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> but, no, there was a sort of, when Syndicate came out, there was a whole, for lack of a better term, shitstorm about people and some of the official like Ubisoft and Assassin's Creed handles kind of having mixed messages of whether or not he was straight or gay or bi. But in, to the end, it was Jacob Fry is, bi is bisexual at the end. Like it okay. was closed like that. But like we don't, he, in the information that we've been given, he is never canonically married or it's never said that he married. Mm. So he could have had a female partner. He's clearly had children. Um, we don't know what age. It could be as recent as like six months after the end of the game, there's someone pregnant. Yeah. To the point yeah. of like maybe when they he's come back from India or something. Like there's that five ish year window where his son or daughter or would be old enough to have children of their own in a kind of sense of like early to mid like nineteen to twenty four ish range. It's got to be for them. So Syndicate finishes eight. Well, Syndicate story takes place over just a few months, doesn't it? In eighteen sixty-eight. Yeah. I mean, so there's there's no dates given, like, given, is there? The only date we're given is Ethan Fry's death, which ah. is late January, early February, according to the Underworld book. Mm. But other than mm. that, it's really tricky because some of the the protagonists, not protagonists, the targets, like. Um, John Elliotson and the Lord of Cardigan, Lord Cardigan, are historical characters, 
and they have like historical dates of death. Yeah. But Elliotson, who dies in sequence four, dies after Cardigan, who dies in sequence six. <laughs> I can't believe they picked real people for those industrial... Uh, Elliotson was the doctor, wasn't he, in Lambeth Asylum? Lambeth Asylum, yeah. Okay. But he dies after, so there's this whole sort of... Do these sequences happen concurrently, or was it just fuddled? <laughs> or My interpretation right. of why Cardigan dies later is that he fakes his death and goes into hiding, <laughs> which is why it's so difficult to find out who he is, because... To the rest of the world, to maybe the trio of assassins in London, he's already dead. Like mm. this, like figure in British public eye has already died. So, why should he be in a, a Templar? And it's like he's still like, I don't want to say puppeteering because let's be honest, it's Cardigan. We've seen what he's like in game. He's a bit lackluster. Can, can we just quote uh, Jacob Fry, meme lord, and just say, <laughs> "What, what a, a prick." prick. Yes. And you know, every now and then someone on Twitter will say, like, give me your favourite Assassin's Creed quotes. That's the quote that always pops into my head. Jacob it's Fry. The, it's what the eye prick. roll that does it. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the eye brilliant. roll. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, there you go, everyone. That's my favourite Assassin. All, all, all the quotes you get from Altair and Ezio about Ooh. philosophy and deeper meaning of the creed and you've just got, what a prick. <laughs> I, I quite like Evie's at the ball. Um, Miss, are you all right? Do you need assistance? And she just turns around and goes, I never liked balls. And just walks off. <laughs> what is also the key to the waltz, Louise? <laughs> um, one right, um, the key to the waltz is one's right foot. <laughs> Whop. <laughs> sorry, we've gone way off topic. I'm so sorry. Um, what are we talking about? Dates. Uh, where was we going? So yeah, if Lydia Fry was born in 1893, then her mm-hmm. parents, or her mother at least, would have been born early 1870s so yeah not yeah, not so long and again how does that fit with their trip to india uh jacob's trip to india so it's interesting there's mm. there's not much time to play with is there no especially considering in the locust comics which like the um 1872 ish it's set in london they go to the british museum but you never once hear jacob mentioned it's just well, Evie and it's just Evie and Henry, so he's completely off screen. It's just these two, mm. like having their moment in the sun with. I I looked this up. One of the Americans in the comic is Mark Twain, the author. What? Yeah, one of um Samuel Clemens, one of the Pinkertons who comes over in the comic is Mark Twain. Okay. The author of like Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer. Yeah. Um, Are these which comics a whole canonical? Other can of worms. Are these comics That's canonical? A very good question. Yeah, I don't know. It <laughs> seems a little to bit say odd yes, to me. Because I, um, but yeah, Jacob's never mentioned in that period. So was he on like the assassin equivalent of paternity leave? Could be. Yeah. Maybe just taking a few months off for his health. Which would make knows? his son Emmett twenty-one at Lydia's birth, if that was the case. His son is called Emmett unconfirmed it seems it's like fan canon because you know at the beginning of when they're in isabel ardant's london office and rebecca yes. and John get that list of assassins you've got the list of british assassins i've been meaning to ask you about that list for a long time louise i want to it know says, details on every name <laughs> it says emmett fry not Ethan okay. fry so people are assuming that it's oh it's a different character rather gotcha. than a missed namer and everyone's gotcha. just like oh it'll be jacob's son Oh, Hence, that works. That Jacob, works. Emmett, Lydia. I like that. I like how I'm just sitting back listening, thinking, damn, I need to play Syndicate. You do. you do. You're missing out. <laughs> I know. I need to, like, first sell my kidneys. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be rich. But I think mean, the most interesting thing listening to the whole conversation about Syndicate. Is a point that I've wanted to make for years, but I've kept silence because don't upset the fan base. But there is a potential, if handled correctly and tastefully, a modern day Assassin's Creed game can work. Now, I'm not talking post 2000 and 
I'm going to say one, but I may have the date wrong. There's a reason why I'm picking that year. The Great Purge. Exactly. Like, 2000. 2000. That, so at least we're on the same wavelength. <laughs> so there is that potential to play Assassin's Creed games up to The Great Purge because the most forgettable thing about Assassin's Creed lore is it's not ancient history. You know, the Assassin's lore runs all the way up to The Great Purge of 2000 and beyond. And Syndicate actually shows it if handled tastefully. And I know Syndicate does feel rushed and maybe could be better. It does show that you can handle an Assassin's Creed game modernised tastefully and actually keep the core mechanics if done right. So I'm hoping they do explore more games in this modern era set closer to The Great Purge as long as they pick the histories that are more tasteful and more easy to do do without being disrespectful if that makes sense because i really don't think you can be that much disrespectful with a steampunked industrial london or i might be missing something with history because i'm not that good of history <laughs> but has anyone got any more points to make on lydia fry before we wrap up I've covered everything I wanted to mention. My list is gone. <laughs> yeah, mine was just a lot about like suffragette and like missing lore and yeah, TLDR. I think she would be a very much a suffragette. I feel like oh, there is one point I didn't mention that I um. So Declan, you mentioned about Lydia working better as a London-centric protagonist again. We still have that loose end of Sam. And as we know from Lord of the Rings, everyone needs a Sam. We do. What if we have the dual protagonist thing and he's our espionage in the Western Front or wherever he's based protagonist? So we have the suffragette side and the World War One side that sometimes might interlink with like maybe their villain or like the big bad, quote unquote, of the game, of the Templars they're trying to eradicate in this point, has something to do with both of them. And they're just taking different angles to meet meet it. I would actually love to see that. And you mentioned uh, close to the beginning how communications was shortened, so it was easy to mm. get notice. You could have a really great in-depth game loop where that can be explained historically and canically where Lydia Fry could do a certain mission as a, um, and, and then send a note across triggering the next mission and then it's done tastefully and kind of works logically. And I could actually see that working really well and something I would play as long as, and again, they keep away from RPG mechanics for it mm. because... The RPG mechanics that Syndicate has is perfect, it's just light enough and it keeps the core game going, but with the RPG mechanics we've got for the mythology series, I just couldn't see an espionage game working, and that's no, no criticism. I agree with you, yeah. I, I love the RPG mechanics, but I just, yeah. if, if we're going espionage, I'm not filling out a 20 skill mod yeah. tree on stealth. It's the same reason that Syndicate isn't a roguelike like Hades, like it's the design of the game fits the style of the game you want to tell. Like Syndicate isn't an RPG, more for the fact that I feel like it wouldn't fit. Like Lydia's game wouldn't fit an RPG because you weren't trying to tell a game that's set on a battlefield. You're setting something behind the front lines. They may have like their Wonder Woman moment where they go over the top, <laughs> whether it's successful or not. Yes. With like the Angel of Mons bit, which I think would be a pretty cool like, like Act One, Act Two ending sequence, for like to t- like the shift the shift the ties a little bit, or show character growth, or maybe like influence for Peace of Eden or something. Who knows? But yeah, I agree with you. RPG couldn't work for this. I think as well, it's it's kind of selfish why I say RPG won't work. I just if we do get like a really nice Lydia Fry type game, I don't want it to be overlooked 
my mechanics. I want people to be invested in the character and the story. And I feel like with the how they've written the last three games, the RPG mechanics go hand in hand with the story and the setting. But I really feel if you try to plaster something to a Lydia Fry game, it may take away from her story and her character. Because she doesn't seem somebody who's going to have like, uh, what's the, what's the term? Magic pockets for different gears. <laughs> She's going to be carrying a kunai and probably some quick stealth gear. Mm. To be fair, they did have big pockets, but probably not big enough to hide a rifle. <laughs> or a spear. I think that's another mocap thing, isn't it? Where they, it's it's kind of a thing they do on, on the set where when, they, when they're given something, they put it behind their back and it's like that's that's like a thing that all these mocap performers do so what you see on the screen is the the character sort of putting something behind their back into their you know their inventory as we would call it as gamers but yeah it's something that they do on mocap stages where they have they have this invisible pocket where they put all their stuff i really now just want to see more mocap behind the scenes you've got me interested is it people in green lycra like, suits with giant ping pong balls because if so it is. There that are is also hilarious. ones of pets. Yeah, There's don't some really tell good me ones that. of The Last of Us 2 with the dogs. Oh, don't tell me that. They're just going to look cuter. Dogs wearing <laughs> mocap suits, my friend. Yeah. But didn't mocap... Right. See, I listened to... Um, so you mentioned earlier, Louise, Victoria Atkin hosts a podcast about performance capture, motion capture. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think in one of her early episodes, she, she was talking with someone and mocap started... I could be wrong here. Anyway, you can do your own research. Mocap started from Pete from doctors wanting to capture the movement of skeletons and joints on animals. I think yeah. I could be wrong, but I think, they... and then it kind of transitioned yeah. into, well, if we can capture a horse galloping or a dog running on a treadmill, we can capture humans and then animate them and all the rest of it. Yeah. Because before I knew what mocap was, the only terminology I'd seen it used again with like the ping pong ball suit is in a medical frame of mind right like yep. seeing people's walking gait particularly like sports health research or mm. rehabilitation from crashes or accidents so to see that kind of transition would be quite interesting to look into so i think we may have um oh, run out golly. of time i think I don't even know what time it is. <laughs> to be honest, if you don't close the show, Louise and I are just going to carry on talking. So for okay, God's sake, close the show. <laughs> um, before I anyway, do... Louise, I've got two more points. No, 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 I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Here's the essay I prepared earlier. <laughs> <laughs> before I um, drop some links to where you can find us and stalk us, um, I do want to quickly point out two quick tidbits. This week, we cannot run a stream on sunday um we are working on so many secret projects we need a nap we do we we need a nap i need tea and a nap i'm old i'm 27 but getting old (laughs) but my knees our plan was to do a sunday stream every sunday wasn't it but it's just that we've got so much going on over the next four or five days that we're going to give sunday night a skip but we will be back next sunday with a live stream um also Big news that it's better to do it here than Twitter. We are in the process of reorganizing our Discord server. So if you join and it's quiet or stuff's changing, don't be alarmed. We're just trying to reshuffle to make it a bit more of a hub, we're hoping, for all content creators and people to chat to us and have a good laugh about Assassin's Creed. So don't be alarmed if you stumble on the server and channels suddenly go missing one day and the next all quiet we're just hammering away behind the scenes like machine builders who do weekly podcasts and try and run discord (laughs) i hope i have the mental capacity to remember all this (laughs) so thank you louise for joining and everyone for listening if you enjoy this episode and you want to update your thoughts on lydia fry and how a game could look or you really just want to hash out some syndicate knowledge, then you can follow our Twitter at AC Let's Talk and at James the Liquid. Uh, Louise's podcast is at the Dirty Archer. I'm just going to plug it because if we're talking syndicate, I tend to bet she's going to get flooded with tags. So 
Bring go it. Give it. Torment, give it. Give it. <laughs> please go torment James and Louise with some syndicate questions. Like, is your homework that I will only do you know, do you know what I've realised, Declan, just to interrupt your beautiful flow there. Unity and syndicate are the initiate duology. Louise is the syndicate nerd and I am the unity nerd. We're kind of a perfect couple here for you to sort of interview about these two games. Anyway, and, just just a random thought ahead. Carry on. <laughs> and I'm the 15-year series player, literally 15 years since AC1, and I'm You're still the vet. here. You're the veteran. Yeah. Yeah. But, like, I, I know I'm segueing into the ending, but can I just remind people that the series came out when I was 12 years old? I am 27, and I've practically been playing this game nearly 15 years of my life. You're getting old, mate. You're getting old. Well, it's the 15th year anniversary yeah. this year. So, just a bit of perspective to people. I played AC1 when I was 12. I'm playing Valhalla as a 27-year-old, and I'm not stopping playing Assassin's Creed. It's too fun, but... <laughs> yeah, 15 years of my life on a game franchise. Perfect. So... Again, so uh, you can also email us at Assassin's Creed Let's Talk at Gmail. Um, I'm always open to chats or anything for the emails. And hopefully we'll see you all next week. See you all soon. Bye.